Okay, Ozzy here. How's everybody doing? Today we're going to take a look at Starbucks, a company I'm sure that almost everyone knows. Famous for selling cups of coffee for $5, $6, $7 a piece. They've got about 28,000 locations globally, but recently the stock has fallen. If we take a look here. Stock's fallen from a little over $60 to down to about $49 a share. So we're going to dive into some of the fundamental research on this stock. We'll take a look at some of the recent developments as well as longer term results. And I'm going to review the recent quarterly results, the conference call, the annual report, investor presentation, and some other documents. Uh, so this is the part of the video that's like a do-it-yourself home reno show uh, where all the time-consuming work happens off video. Otherwise, it would make it for the longest vlog of all time. So I'll be back to walk you through some of the highlights in just a minute. Okay, and we are back. Uh, I've put together some elements for discussion, and I'll share my screen so you can follow along. Uh, when we're done, we'll summarize some of the key considerations and set up some scenarios. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm getting started is just find a place in the reporting usually somewhere in the beginning of the annual report uh, where you can see some of the financial highlights just to sort of get a long-term picture of some of the key financial metrics. So why don't we jump in? We'll jump over to uh, the annual report to start. Here we go. As you can see here, they've um, given a nice five-year summary of revenue, some of the key profitability metrics, earnings per share, uh, dividends and a couple of key balance sheet metrics. So I think, you know, for me, some of the key takeaways here is, you know, revenue is growing nicely. If you look back in 2013, they've taken it from 15 billion in total revenue up to 22. Every year has been improving and growing, which is obviously as an investor, something that you want to see. Um, if you look at operating income, it's there's something that happened in 2013 that we may want to take a look at, but it's essentially gone from from three million uh, three billion sorry up to up to four billion. Earnings per shares had a really nice uptick, buck 35 in 2014 up to dollar 97. So everything looks really good. Dividends per share have essentially doubled over the period. And um, what else should we note here? Uh, long term debt long-term debt right here. You've seen that come up somewhat, but if you look at the long-term long debt in relation to profitability or, or EBITDA, even though the calculation is not here, uh, still relatively minor. Uh, okay, so that's a good place to start. They've also got a financial highlights tab in the investor relations seg section of the website, which I think is great, gives a great graphical uh, depiction of some of the key metrics. Let me just see here as we set this up. So there's your revenue chart up and to the right. I think the chart on the top right, comparable stores, sales, growth, that's probably the most important chart to the story here based on, on my research. You can see over the last four or five years, it's been hovering in that five to 7% range but that dropped off to 3% in 2017. And we'll probably see when we, we jump into their most recent results that that's what investors are likely worried about is, does that same store sales growth drop even further? Um, could it potentially go negative? Uh, those are some of the things we wanna see. Operating income, operating margin. This one actually surprised me. Operating margin here, um, when you think about Starbucks selling cups of coffee for $5, I actually would would have expected the margins to be meaningfully higher. Um, it probably speaks to the fact that there's a lot of fixed cost in the business. You think about the cost to rent each of their locations, uh, the cost of employees and staffing. Obviously, there's some sort of direct food and beverage cost to um, the goods that they uh, that they sell. But actually, the margins are lower than I would have thought. And you can see they're fairly stable here uh, historically um, at around 18 to 20 percent. 
And then if you take it down here to the EPS, again, sort of gone from about $1.35 in 2014 to about $2 a share in 2017. So that's a good, good sort of high level start and summary. I think the next thing I want to look at is the recent results. So share price is off $10. We've got to imagine uh, that investors are somewhat concerned with the recent results. There's the conference call transcript right there. So here we have um, the press release for Q2. You can see there's a little bit of nice marketing up here, record results, uh, record net income, record rewards membership. Uh, but when you dig a little bit deeper, if you look at the comp store sales here, up 2% globally. So again, trending down again from that that 5% number down to 3%, here we are at 2%. So I think investors are probably starting to get concerned that um, it, that the same store sales growth is going to be difficult to maintain. Let's just jump down a little bit to where they give some guidance and outlook. There we go. Fiscal 2018 targets. So the company's reiterated it's following full year targets. Um, they continue to expect approximately 2,300 new Starbucks stores globally. So this is a chain that continues to grow. Uh, they are closing some stores in the U.S., but net-net, uh, this is a business that is continuing to exhibit growth. They are expecting to hit that 3 to 5% comparable store sales growth globally. But here they, they point out that they do expect that to be the nor near the low end of the range. And what else here? EPS. Um, and then the gap EPS. Their adjusted EPS range here, that, that 248 to 252 number. So essentially going forward, I think investors are somewhat concerned about the growth here. Uh, historically, this has been a relatively high growth stock and as we'll find out later in the in the valuation and the multiple it, it's a stock that's had a, a fairly rich multiple attached to it so let's see here next we want to look at uh, some of the strategic priorities so most companies will actually have an investor presentation which is a great place to start it is a marketing document so you have to be a little bit careful take it with a grain of salt that um, they're typically going to spin the business and the investment opportunity in the best light. But here we are. Let's uh, pull up their most recent um, investor presentation. It was done at an Oppenheimer consumer conference back in June 2018. So just, just about 12 days old at this point right now. So they've highlighted some of their strategic priorities. And why don't we just jump into that on, on slide six and see what, what they're highlighting as some of their key priorities going forward. Here we go. Strategic priorities. Okay, so uh, probably not surprising anyone here, uh, one of their key priorities is to accelerate growth. And they talk about both the U.S. and China, which are going to be key elements to the story. Um, Second one is expand the global reach of the Starbucks brand, brand and leveraging the Global Coffee Alliance. And lastly, is sharpen their focus on increasing shareholder returns. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, the, the buybacks and the dividends. But I think to start, we should really focus in on, on number one, which is the growth. Um, this, is a, this is a business that's delivered fairly strong and robust growth historically. And I think the question in the market, or one of the reasons why the shop, this area of price would be down, of course, the, the founder has, uh, has moved on and um, the CFO has also just announced his retirement. But one of the reasons why the market might be a little bit skittish here is they're, they're concerned about their ability to maintain uh, the growth rates. So let's jump into that uh, store growth and we can go on the same investor presentation. We'll talk about the U.S. first. Slide 21. I believe. There we go. 
All right, so here's here's a good graphical depiction of what um, what's been happening in the U.S. So store count is still growing. I think that's really important to keep in mind here because there's a lot of of, of uh, negative press around uh, store closures. So they're gonna here they say accelerate closure of underperforming company operated stores to about 150 in fiscal 19. They're gonna slow store expansion by about 125 and the plan fiscal 19 net store growth is around 3%. So net store growth is still growing, but again, as you can see, when you compare it in this sort of vis visual here, store growth is not growing in the States nearly to the same extent that it did historically. So growing, just not as quickly. We'll take a look at China as well, and we're going to jump back earlier in this presentation here, I think on slide eight. So let's jump up there with me here. There we go. Slide eight, okay. Okay. So here's, here's one of their key growth opportunities and you can see the way that they're positioning it here. China, in terms of coffee consumption, is still far behind the United States. Uh, if you look at the stats on cups per capita, uh, they believe that if they can tap into this market, it's a huge growth opportunity for them. So in China, less than one cup per capita per year compared to 300 in the States. Um, the middle class, again, expected to double between 2018 and 2022. So if we go down to the next slide, they're referring to China as their second home market. I believe they've been there for over 20 years now. Um, and they're looking to grow to double their store count by 2022. Be in 100 new cities, 600 new stores per year, and essentially accelerate accelerate the pace, probably 20% faster than what they had previously been, been guiding towards. So a big part of the growth story here is going to be China. Uh, are they going to be able to be successful in rolling out these, these new stores as fast as they'd, they'd hope? And how profitable will they be? Other point that I wanted to touch on a little bit was the loyalty program. I think that's something, and I haven't benchmarked it against any of its competitors or peers, so that would be something to, to look at a little bit further. But I, I get the sense that they're ahead of the curve in terms of their, their digital app, their loyalty program, uh, the number of subscribers. They actually have something in their, in their investor relations website that, here we go. It just walks through some of the metrics around their, their Starbucks card, their loyalty, and their mobile dashboard. Uh, you can see here the mobile app is actually responsible for almost a third of transactions. So it's gone up from about a quarter of transactions. I think we're just talking yeah, U.S., U.S. only. But you can see the trend here. In the last couple of years, 25% of customer transactions are being processed through their mobile app to about 34% now. Active members in their loyalty program, again, these stats are U.S. only. So I'd be really curious to, to learn a little bit more about what they're doing internationally and what kind of success they're having. But the loyalty program had about 12 million active members in Q2 2016. Fast forward two years, they're up to 15 million. So let me just do a little quick, quick uh, math here. 15 divided by 12 so it's up 25 percent. so it's growing around 11 12 percent a year so not not tremendous growth but nice solid growth and i think this is you know when you think about the future and everyone's talking about artificial intelligence and ability to to run uh, data analytics and learn about your customer this is something that's probably not going to show up in the next one to two year results but in the medium to long term this is probably an area where Starbucks can really differentiate themselves against their competition. Um, the more they know about their customers uh, should allow them. It might actually help them when they think about fixed costs and wages and overhead. Uh, this type of intel, having customers order directly through the mobile app before they're even in the store could, 
increased turnaround time. So there's lots of things here that could end up showing in the financial statements in years to come. All right, so we've seen a quick high level financial summary. We've jumped into the investor presentation to look at a couple of the key strategies. And I think we've talked about their, their loyalty program. And now we want to dive into some of the details around the financial the, the financial uh, statements. It's one thing to look at the high level. Uh, it's another thing to, you know, if we go back to this investor presentation that's got this nice marketing spin on it. Um, but I think it's really important to jump into the actual annual report. If you're going to look at a company and analyze them, get into the weeds a little bit. And so we'll jump back to the 10K, the annual report. And let's just look at some of the details here. So we'll go right to the statements, which I believe are on page 46. Not quite. There we go. There we go. So we go into the actual accountant prepared statements of earnings. There we go. So you can see here, and I think, again, when we talk about the operating margin, and it, and it surprised me a little bit how low it was, you have to remember how much fixed costs they have in the business. So if you look at their total revenue here, we can look at the mix. Um, company operated stores are providing the, the vast majority of the revenue. Licensed stores are going to provide a, a smaller amount of revenue, but it's going to be higher margin. It's going to most likely be some sort of a royalty based on sales. So um, while the uh, percentage of revenue from the licensed stores is smaller, it's likely to be a bigger contributor to the bottom line uh, on a relative basis, I should add. And then CPG, food service and other, this is sort of the deal that they announced with Nestle, um, selling the pods in the grocery store, selling the branded product um, anywhere other than at the actual um, Starbucks store itself, where you go and order a coffee. You can see that going from 2.1 billion to 2.4. So there's nice steady growth across the spectrum here. If you look at the cost of sales, including occupancy costs here, so including rent, you can you can see that it. They've got a significant fixed cost hurdle to meet store operating expenses. I haven't jumped into the notes here, but I've got to imagine a big component of that's your labor. And then there's depreciation and amortization expense. Uh, you know, when they open up stores, they've got leaseholds to fit it up and make it look like a Starbucks and, and that stuff's going to be amortized over time. And I would, I would argue that's true, real depreciation. Sometimes we look at EBITDA and, and back out the depreciation and amortization. In this case, I think EPS is probably the best metric to look at. And as we scroll down here, it's a relatively clean income statement. Again, here they show their earnings per share, basic, diluted. So I think something to think about, and, and we'll get into their valuation in a little bit, but, but historically, this is a stock that's traded in and around 30 times earnings. So this has had a very a, a premium valuation attached to it. And if you look at the growth just on an earnings per share basis, I think you really need to question, does that growth justify the valuation, at least that it had historically? So if you look at 1.97 divided by 1.82, that's just 8% growth over two years. So the EPS growth in the last couple of years hasn't really been there. Now they're projecting $2.40 in and around that range for 2018. So obviously that's a, a really nice step up divided by 1.97. So they're projecting about 20% 20, 20 EPS growth this year. And that's the type of growth that you'd expect to see for a company trading with a premium price to earnings multiple, but just keep that in mind. Other thing, when you look at shares outstanding, we'll talk about um, the dividends and the buybacks uh, towards the end, but share counts actually coming down. And as an investor, I mean, you can have multiple opinions on this, but shares coming down is usually a very good sign. It means uh, you own a slightly larger share of the profits each and every year, um, would suggest to me that they're using 
some of their free cash flow to buy back shares. So that's the income statement. Speed up a little bit here, uh, but we'll go through the balance sheet. Again, really important just to take a, a, a good, clean look at the, the full accountant prepared balance sheet, not just some of the summary numbers that are presented. So you can see here they're operating with $2.5 billion in cash. Inventory, $1.3 billion, so actually not a ton uh, relative to their sales and their cost of goods sold. Property, plant, and equipment, uh, $5 billion. Goodwill of $1.5 billion, I imagine that might relate to one of the acquisitions they've made previously. Come down here. Uh, stored value card liability. So when you get those prepaid Starbucks cards or you load your app up, um, that's cash that they've received that they have yet to actually deliver a good. So if you actually look back at their cash balance of, of 2.5 billion, about half of that is actually cash that they've received up front. It's a beautiful thing from a working capital perspective, but they still ultimately do need to deliver a cup of coffee uh, or whatever it is uh, that the customers redeem that stored value for. So that's uh, shown as a liability on the balance sheet. Long-term debt, this is something that we didn't talk about too much in the financial summary, but it has been increasing. I would say it's still not at a level where, um, you know, $4 billion of debt uh, relative to $5.5 billion of book equity. And uh, I haven't calculated the EBITDA, but even if you just, if we scroll back up and you look at your um, operating income of $4 billion, add on your depreciation and amortization, even if we looked at round numbers, sort of five billion of debt, they've got less than one turn of, uh, sorry, five billion of EBITDA. They've got less than one turn of, of debt on the books here. So I'm not too concerned about uh, leverage at this point. And then lastly, we'll jump into the free cash flow. Uh, so we'll look at the cash flow statement. This is always, to me, a really interesting way to figure out how the money is generated and what it's being used for. It sort of ties the, the income statement and the balance sheet together. So if we look here, um, when you take their earnings, about $2.9 billion, you add in their depreciation, there's going to be a whole bunch of working capital adjustments and some non-cash stock-based compensation. But it sort of nets out around the, the $4 billion number here. Then if we go into investing activities, you can see that they're making about 1.3 to $1.5 billion worth of additions to property, plant, and equipment. So this is again back to my point around where I think earnings per share is probably a good metric to use here. If you look up top, depreciation and amortization is running a little bit uh, over a billion dollars. So they're investing for growth, but you can expect in any given year, you know, there's probably at least a billion dollars worth of investment they need to be making to maintain their stores, maintain uh, how they, the look, the feel. Um, and so without, you know, really trying to slice and dice it too much, you're sort of going to end up back at a number close to their earnings per share if you're looking at a free cash flow basis. And, and so I think for the purposes of our analysis for, for this particular stock, um, we'll use EPS as a bit of a proxy and if you look at their financing activities this is this is where you're going to find out how much are they paying out in terms of dividends here we go cash dividends paid one and a half billion you've seen that almost double in the last two years and repurchase of common stock so essentially and where are they finding there you go so they've taken on close to a billion dollars in debt each year and they're essentially using it to buy back, buy back shares is what they're doing. Um, and they're returning between the dividends and uh, the share buybacks. Yeah, they're, they've been returning three to three and a half billion dollars a year. Uh, and it looks like based on management guidance that that's expected to go up. Okay. Uh, so that's a good look at the financial statements. Let's see if there's anything else that I wanted to mention there. Oh yeah, minimum rent. Uh, let's jump into page seven. We're going deep in the weeds here. 
I'm going to page 74. Uh, and I imagine I didn't get that right. Let's see here. Leases, here we go. I think anytime you've got a business that has um, a large fixed cost component, you really want to think about what that means. Uh, so if we dive into note 10 of the annual report here, it'll actually show us and tell us what the minimum rent payment is. And it looks to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.3 billion. Uh, minimum of 1.2 billion and then they've got some sort of a contingent rent most likely based on the revenue of each individual location so we can expect um, a minimum based on the leases that they have today uh, a minimum of uh, 1.3 billion in rent okay. and that's I mean, a few of the key items I wanted to walk through on the annual report. What's next? So I think just to wrap up our analysis, there's a couple more points we want to touch on. We want to touch on um, management and insider ownership. Let me see if I actually have Schedule A, uh, Schedule 14A up here. I might not. I do not. Okay. I think for management, Howard Schultz has a significant ownership in the business. None of the other executive do. Um, it's always something I want to know. It doesn't mean I'm not going to look at or invest in a company that doesn't have good alignment between uh, the management team and, uh, and the shareholders. But I just I want to be aware. I want to have that knowledge. And in this case, you know, Howard Schultz, I think he owns in and around 40, 40 million shares. Uh, don't quote me on that number. Uh, but the other C-suite executives really don't hold much. It's probably a result of options and stock compensation awards. I, you know, none of them at least appear to have put a significant um, amount of capital to work. Now, when I talk about significant here, it's all relative. Um, they may own a couple million dollars worth of the stock, um, but I'm not considering that to be relevant at this point. And then valuation. So if we go back to the annual report here, now that we've taken a look at the business, we know, okay, so if you look at the share price here, we know it was trading up whew, as high as about $63. It's down to 48, so it's, it's off significantly. So let's just take a look at the valuation. I think here we go. So based on two dollars per share historically, you've got forty-nine dollar share price. That's about twenty-four point five times earnings. And if we give them the benefit of the doubt for the two dollars and forty cents of earnings per share that they're more or less guiding to this year, that would work out to be about twenty times earnings, forty-nine dollars divided by two dollars and forty cents. This stock. If you go back, I mean, it was only a matter of uh, about six months ago, they traded about $65 and nothing had really, the earnings per share numbers would have been in around the same realm, at least at the time. So if you think about $65 per share over $2 of earnings, this is a stock that was trading at a rich uh, premium valuation, sort of 30 times plus uh, PE. And it's come off substantially. So it's it's about 20 times forward EPS right now. Uh, just to note, I haven't done a complete comparable analysis, but if you look at someone like a McDonald's, it's actually trading at a similar P multiple, about 24 times uh, historical P. So a similar range to Starbucks right now. And then the last point I'll make just on valuation I always like to look at how profitable, in terms of return on equity, return on invested capital, how profitable these businesses are, what's the likelihood that they'll be able to compound um, over time. So here in this case, if you look at net earnings of about 2.8 billion, 
2.9 billion. If you divide that by the book equity of 5.5 billion, you actually get a return on equity of over 50 percent, which which is very attractive. Now, of course, here, what are they doing? Their equity base, you know, as an investor, their equity base is actually shrinking here. If you look at at uh, 2016 to 2017, so through share buybacks and dividends, they're managing their equity base. So as an investor, I mean, the ideal scenario is if you can grow and compound that, that equity base at, at meaningful ROEs. So this company is generating extremely attractive return on equity, but they're not growing the book equity, at least, at least not at, at this point in time. But 50% plus ROEs are extremely attractive in the industry. And so that takes us to our last point. We're going to look at um, the dividends, the growth. Um, current yields about 2%. So again, it's starting to creep up into a territory where that, that's, that's meaningful. Usually stocks that sort of have a 1% yield or one and change typically get overlooked by dividend investors. But in and around that 2% yield, particularly if you can believe that um, you're going to get some good dividend growth. And, and that's clearly what management's telling you here. If we jump into their presentation. There it is. So towards the end of their shareholder presentation, their investor presentation, here they've highlighted. Back in 2014, there was a combination of dividends and buybacks of, of $1.6 they haven't actually given you the numbers here because they, they don't want to hold themselves to a specific dollar, but they are guiding uh, the target to $25 billion over the next three years, which is, which is significant um, relative to the market cap of, of this business. So as an investor, I think you can expect at least, you know, assuming, assuming uh, management's able to hit their their financial metrics and profitability metrics, they're going to be looking to return significant capital, probably in a combination of dividends and buybacks is, uh, is what they've been doing in the past. And quarterly dividend continues to go up. We won't look at the historical chart, but you can, you can see back over time, this is a dividend that's kind of crept up nicely over the last four to five years. So if you believe in the growth, if you believe that they're going to continue to be able to grow, maybe even at a more moderate pace, uh, than what they've shown historically. Um, expect to get a nice uh, growing dividend here. Okay. And that pretty much wraps up the analysis piece. So we'll come back and we'll talk about some of our key findings, the strengths, the risks, and key drivers. And then we'll look at three illustrative uh, scenarios here. All right, so here we are uh, with some key considerations uh, that I've put put together on a slide here. So let's just quickly recap some of the things that we looked at. Strengths, I mean, there's no question about it. Starbucks is a dominant global brand uh, with a product that's addictive to, I mean, anyone who's, uh, who's drinking a cup of coffee or some caffeine in the morning knows that um, that's something that could become a little bit addictive. I think the other point here to keep in mind, they have a real strong track record of growth. You know, when we looked at those financial summary tabs the last sort of five years, really nice revenue consistently up and to the right, profits essentially up and to the right. Um, and, and that's over a five year uh, time frame. So that's impressive. Also loyalty and the digital lead. Um, you know, I, I know I have the, the Starbucks app on my phone and I, I actually don't have many apps um, believe that they're out to a head start here. This will be something that I think in the medium term will potentially be a real differentiator. And then lastly, strong return on equity. I mean, the, uh, the return on equity that they're generating is, is definitely top tier. Some of the risks, stagnating U.S. sales growth. And we sort of saw that in their, even in their investor presentation, which tends to be a bit of a sales document that they're really slowing down um, the new store growth in the US. They're closing down some of the underperforming stores. Next point, uh, China trade tensions. Uh, you know, China clearly, if you look at, if you look at the Starbucks conference call, if you look at their, um, 
if you look at their investor presentation, China is a huge part of the growth strategy here. And as we know right now, uh, there's some tension between the U.S. and China, uh, some trade talks. We know that China in the past has prevented some U.S. businesses, particularly in the tech sector, from operating in China. And while Starbucks is already there, I think, you know, as an investor, you need to be mindful of the fact that this is a real risk to the business. And without China, uh, Starbucks yeah. as a growth story uh, probably becomes a little bit challenged. Third risk, it's a highly competitive industry. You know, it, the margins on selling a cup of coffee are extremely high. Uh, they're not the only ones trying to do it. Uh, they arguably have been the most successful to date, but you're going to know that their competitors are continually looking at ways to, to take a dent uh, and take a slice of their market share. And another risk here, which, which sort of surprised me, just looking at the operating margins coming in at under 20% uh, with the high fixed cost model, I think... I think that's something we need to be aware of, especially if you're looking, you know, out one, two years where same store sales growth might flatline, might even turn negative. Um, or if you have some wage pressure coming out, there's not a ton of room to play with. So we sum up sort of the key drivers for the stock. And of course, this is not exhaustive, uh, clearly, uh, just with a couple bullets here. Um, but I, I want to hammer home the point, this is not simply same store sales growth. I mean, that can be a very short term measure. It can it can be a little bit volatile, but really their ability to grow revenue over time. And that's in mature markets. It's it's also on the second bullet ability to drive growth in China and some of their emerging markets. But how can they drive the top line? And they're going to do that in a combination of adding new stores and then increasing same store sales growth for the existing store base that they they already have. Another key driver, this digital conversion, the Starbucks app. Um, again, are you going to see that show up meaningfully in financial results in the next year or two? Probably not. But I'd imagine that's something that will increase their uh, competitive moat uh, going forward. And lastly, just the overhead. You know, some are concerned with you know rising minimum wages. Obviously, the cost of rent uh, is significant here. And the leaseholds, when anytime you're adding new stores um, and fitting them up, there's a lot of overhead here that needs to get covered off. And so those are sort of four key drivers that I've highlighted. So if we move on to our, our three scenarios, and again, let's just do this here. Here we go. So three illustrative scenarios for discussion. We've got our, our bull case on the left, We've got our base case, which is the the ostrich in the background there, not sure what to do. And, and then we've got the bear case on the right. Again, these, these by no means are these exhaustive scenarios. This is just looking at a few of the key considerations we've come up with, starting to think through some of these scenarios and how it might affect the stock price. So let's start, start with the bull case. Let's assume that they're able to maintain their operating margins in that 19, 20% range. Same store sales growth actually returns to the five to seven percent range. So let's assume that this three percent, two percent year is 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 just a short term setback. Um, and again, with all of these scenarios, you have to look at well, what what earnings per share number are you looking at? Is it 2018, 2019, 2020? We're going to make some simplistic assumptions here, uh, but let's just assume it's a 20, 20 cent EPS impact on the two dollars and forty cents that they're expecting this year, and if they were to drive growth even further, if same store sales growth were returned to that five to seven percent range, will the stock go back to a 30 plus PE? I'm not sure. Um, probably tend to be a bit more conservative than that. But I think it's fair to say if they can drive that type of growth, they, they should be in and around a 22 to 26 times PE range. Again, just my guess. Um, and that would imply a share price of $55 to $65. So based on Based on a $49 share price in the bull scenario, there's there's meaningful upside there, assuming, again, that they can return to those mid to high single digit same store sales growth. The base case, again, similar similar sort of variables, but just different assumptions. So we're, again, we're going to show them maintaining their operating margins. They, they have been quite stable in that 19 to 20% over the last few years. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they can hold them there. Um, 
same store sales growth here will be the key one that we turn down a little bit. We'll just allow it to stabilize in that two to three percent range. So important here, our base case isn't showing same store sales growth going negative. Um, it's showing it sort of almost at inflation, two to three percent range. PE multiple here, imagine more of a market multiple, a little bit of a premium probably because of the brand, uh, the strength of the brand. The, that typically garners a premium in the market. So we're showing about an 18 to 22 times multiple. And that would imply a share price of 43 to $53, uh, which is in and around the range. You know, $49 is around the midpoint of that range here uh, where it's trading currently. And so this is probably about as close to what the market is expecting um, for the stock right now. And then lastly, our bear, our bear side scenario, this is where we're seeing operating margins drop by 200 basis points. So think about 20% margins going down to 18. So fixed overhead cost increases, maybe minimum wages going up are, are having an impact. And that would probably, I did some very high level um, calculations just to drive down to what the potential EPS impact would be. You'd have to really sharpen your pencil, but let's assume it's about a 20 to 30 cent EPS impact. I've, I've put in 30 cents here for now. So your $2.40 would go down to 2.10. Uh, and again, just to be clear, this is not my projection for their 2018 EPS. This is just doing some math off of a base earnings per share figure just to sort of show what impact it might have on the share price. And then we go back to absolutely no same store sales growth. So expect that China growth would be ops offset by negative comps in the mature, in the mature markets. So um, no, no growth op margins go down. So this is painting a pretty, a pretty dire scenario here. P multiple in that scenario is going to compress. You're, you're probably going to come off. Um, I've still kept it, you know, 14 to 16 times in the mid, you know, mid teens again, because of the strength of the brand. Um, and that would imply a share price. If you take $2 and 10 cents EPS and, and you multiply it by those multiples, you're in that $30 to $35 range. So meaningful downside from here up to you to, to decide whether you think that's really a realistic scenario. This is definitely a scenario that's got everything going wrong, but that's the point of, of, uh, you know, doing some analysis and thinking through scenarios is to, is you can play devil's advocate with yourself and, and in discussions with others and, and figure out, well, what probability would each of these, uh, scenarios have? And so that's it. That's, um, that's the first video for ostrich investing. Um, thanks everyone for watching. Um, look forward to the next one. Would love to get your feedback. Uh, let me know what you think. Which scenario is the most likely? Uh, have I missed anything? Do you have a different take? If you like this video, obviously, please uh, buy me a Starbucks. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, if you like this, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to my channel, and share with your fr friends. Again, this is the first video, so subscriber base is extremely low. And until ne next time, this is Ozzy from Ostrich Investing, reminding you, please don't bury your head in the sand. <laughs>